a baby. Took us damn long enough to get here, so thank you all for your patience. We appreciate that. Uh, everybody have tickets for tomorrow night, I hope, if you're here today. In the middle of the work day, yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, huge main event, Yair Rodriguez, Alex Caceres, very excited about this one. Two guys who've never headlined for the UFC before, so an exciting opportunity for those guys. Court McGee getting a fight here in Utah, which should be pretty good. Uh, so a good day plan. Of course, the fighters are, are going to come out here for the formality of weighing in about 5 o'clock. So a lot of good things planned today and, of course, tomorrow. And coming up now, it just so happens, you know, we're trying to blow it out a little bit, our first trip to Utah. So we decided to bring with us the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world. He'll be out in just a minute. Take a look. I think it's, it's harder to stay on top than get on top. You can win the belt, but how many times can you defend it? And I've been a champion since 2012, it's 2016, so almost four years. And people are training to beat me. But it doesn't matter if it's a new opponent or the same opponent 15 times in a row. I don't care, I am motivated to win. What I need to do is elevate him high, and then I catch his hip. And then I can set his hip down so that his neck comes right here. So that I'm just above his shoulder and I'm already into the cross face. Okay, so he's not sitting up too high where my arm's getting pinned underneath his body. And he's not sitting too low where I've got to reach for him. It's right there. You're not going to find a weakness in DJ. And that's one of the reasons that he's been able to hold the belt for so long. There's the intangibles. There's the mental toughness. The understanding of the game in every aspect. You're pushing his hips down so that his neck, yeah, don't push it too far, but just place it right where you want the choke to be. Gotcha. He can do all the things that, that you need to maintain that title. When I come through, I'm going to pinch right here. And I'm going to float where I can float right here. <laughs> See, I'm pinched. <laughs> and I can slide in. We don't really focus that much on our opponent because the opponent's always gonna change. Bend the head and poke him into me right here. I just bring his head into my chest. He's gonna follow. Okay, and now he's light and I can move him with my legs. Put him in a position. That's why I think we've been so successful and I'm also a willing student to understand and learn and grow and change. Okay, one more time. Put knee on, yeah. kick over, kick back, there you go. Much easier, huh? There's things that he's not perfect at yet as a martial artist, and we focus on those things. We look at the greatest people in every combat sport, and even outside of combat sports. And there's always things that we can work on. I'm gonna train my ass off, and then my training will speak for itself. You tell me what date that Demetri Johnson needs to be his best, we'll go in there and we'll handle business. All right, here he is, folks, one of the best professional athletes in the world, the UFC flyweight champion, Mighty Mouse Demetrius Johnson. So we got DJ here. I mean, the advantage, of course, he's a Washington State guy, so you know he wasn't going to miss the UFC's first show in Salt Lake City. Many of you know the drill here. We got microphones set up on both sides of the stage, so don't be shy. You got DJ for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, we'll start with this brave young man. What's up? What's happening, buddy? Hey, DJ, I got to tell you, on behalf of Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, the entire area, we are grateful that the Pound for Pound Best took time out of his train to come thank, you know, grace us with the Q&A session. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, I do have a question, though, because someone of your stature and your level in this game, you've got so many accomplishments. I mean, you're the longest reigning UFC champion currently. You're your only 125-pound champ. You've got the latest stoppage in history. When you look at all the accomplishments you've had in mixed martial arts, which one do you say is your top shelf one? Probably being the longest reigning, uh, no, probably being the only flyweight champion as of right now. You know, you've seen belts change hand left and right, pass around like hot potatoes. You know, the women's bantamweight division. I mean, you had Ronda Rousey, then Holly Holm, then Misha Tate, then Amanda Nunes. Then you're looking at, you know, the middleweight division from Chris Weidman to Luke Rockhold, then Michael Bisbing, and then you look at the bantamweight division. So well, actually the bantamweight, Dominic Cruz is holding it down. And you look at the lightweight division. So I, I think me being the, you know, the only flyweight champion kind of submits that belt as a, a true champion. And I've seen other guys who were champions aren't champions, but I'm saying like, you know, that's something I can hold up high where it's like, oh, yay, you just got the belt. I've been here. Welcome to the team. How you doing? Yeah. See how long you last. <laughs> no, not really. But that's something I, I really hold up high on my pedestals at. I'm the only champion ever in the UFC flyweight history. 
Love it. Thank you, DJ. Appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Thank you, man. Yes, sir. How are you doing? Big fan. Love watching your fights. Love your energy. Thanks, um, man. My big question is, um, since you've been defending the belt since 2012, how do you feel about the tough finalists getting a shot at your belt after not making their way through the UFC flyweight ranks? You know, um, I'm excited for it, you know. There's so many different organizations out in the world. There's so many, I always tell people, there's always a bigger fish in the sea. Essentially, you know, the middleweight division, lightweight, heavyweight, light heavyweight, you're never going to know who the, other, who the other fish are. So for me, I get that opportunity. So the UFC has gone out there to find other champions, not just other fighters, other champions. I mean, there's a guy from Africa, an African champion. I've seen his belt. I think the thing was real gold. I was a little jealous, you know. Um, there's guys from uh, Legacy. There's a, a French champion. There's a, a Shuto, um, not Shuto Brazil champion, a Shuto Japan champion. So you get all these champions from around the world, throw them in a house to a tournament, and then the winner of that gets to fight me. I think that's pretty dope, you know. When I first heard about the whole logistics of it, you know, I was a little bitter about it because I didn't know the whole logistics. But now that I know, they're having every champion from around the world in a house to get a chance to fight me. You know, I beat Joseph already. I beat Dots, and Dots in a different weight class. I beat, you know, top six or eight. So now it's, we're going to try to do something different. And I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited too. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. How's it going? It's going good. Um, I was going to ask you when I first met you over at the Metro PCS, but I thought I'd wait to ask you here. Thank you. Are we going to see you fight Dominic Cruz anytime soon? Uh, you know, uh, so the thing is, that fight, it probably will happen if I can keep on winning. Mm -hmm. and building my brand up and building my name up. That way, when we do, me and him do meet again, we're going to fucking shuck gold. That's so that, that, that is my goal. Right now, there's no point. You know, I, I want to be able to submit myself as one of the greatest of all time, you know, having the most consecutive title defenses because obviously right now, it's very hard to keep on doing that over and over and over. I mean, right now, the guy who's behind me is two, and that's Daniel Cormier, and I think, not even Dom. Dom just only defended it once, and I'm you know, what, seven ahead of him. So for me, I want to get to 11. And, and let's say I don't get to 11. Let's say I lose my next fight and I'm like, hey, Dom, you still want to you still wanna fight, hey? <laughs> I mean, I can do that because I have a name. And we'll see, but it, it might happen. Sounds good. Appreciate that. Thanks. Good question. Yes, sir. Hey, hey DJ, how you doing? Good. How about you? I'm well, thank you. Uh, so Olympics are coming up. If you had to pick a sport to go into besides anything combative, uh, which Olympic sport would you compete in? Would I have to be good at it, or would I would love to do it? <laughs> no, what you, what you think personally you're able to, to do right now. You know, I think try, uh, oh, no, no, I don't know about that. You're also 5'3", so keep that in mind. Hey, 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 dog. Oh. I, can, I, I, oh. I can run a 438 mile. Oh, damn. <laughs> yeah, these are the last legs can move real fast. Um, you know what? I would say triathlon. I've always wanted to do triathlons. You know, I'm... I, I believe a fantastic runner for my small ass legs, as you pointed out. Um, I can swim pretty decently. I have not gotten into bicycling yet, but I think after I'm done with mixed martial arts, um, to keep my competitive edge up, I think I'm going to do triathlons just because. But my wife doesn't want me to because she's scared I'm not going to come out of the water. But we'll see what happens. But it might be tri triathlons. <laughs> Sweet. Okay, cool. Shame on you. Pretty credentialed track and field athlete, by the way, Demetrius yeah, Johnson. I, I Check mean, the record. Yeah, yeah. Yes, darling, how are you? Good. Why did you ever want to be a fighter? I never wanted to be a fighter. I just, that's what I tell people. People are like, oh man, you must have goals to become a world champion, to do this and that. I was like, nope, I didn't. I was like, I was working a full time job, trying to go to school, and I was learning mixed martial arts. And at the time when I was learning mixed martial arts, there was no 125 pound. There was no 135 or 45, 55. Not that I know of. Um, I didn't even know about wrestling Olympics because I didn't have a father figure in my life. So for me, it was about going to get a job, pay my insurance, pay for my car payment. And then I found a gym to where you can learn mixed martial arts. So I started doing it. And then my coach really didn't push me, push me to go become a pro fighter. He was like, just go do this tournament. I won. Then I go box, I won that. I do a Muay Thai fight, won that, kickboxing. And then this is the product of you have somebody who doesn't really care about being a professional athlete. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.
Yes. Hi, Mighty Mouse. Hello. Um, so this week we saw some changes to the MMA rules that are going to be effective in the new year. Um, some things like uh, what constitutes a grounded fighter, language to the scoring. Can you tell me how fighters need to prepare for that and if there's any change that needs to be done and what are your thoughts on those? Um, well, I think the fighters who are preparing to use this as a tactic not to get hit are idiots and they're, they're not true martial artists. Um, I think the change they need to worry about, well, there's no really changes, you know, as for me, I like it. You know, I'd rather have head stomps and kicks to the head instead of elbows um, because I think to try to kick somebody in the head when they're laying on their back is very hard. Elbows are easy. You know, you could be here go, hush you, ah, just cut you, won the fight. Um, and for this, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think now the rule is that this is a down opponent. Yes. Now, still the same thing. They need palms and the fists to be on the floor. I'm down. Yep. Don't hit me, please. God, no. Still stupid. Yeah. Like, this is a down opponent. Mm -hmm. This is not. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not down. I'm not up. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So they need to really, I mean, I'm glad they're taking a the time out and look at that. That's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but I still think there's a little more work. There's a difference between a down opponent or not. Um, and as for the rule, like the scoring criteria, it's still hard because you have certain fighters that I'm a counter puncher. So if I'm going to counter punch, I'm never going to engage. I'm going to stay back here and wait and wait, wait and counter. So this person, is he in control of the fight? Or is this, who's in control? Let's say I'm going forward and I'm not going to engage either and he's still backing up. You know, I think we maybe pull out the yellow card where it's like, cut, yeah. cut. They just said, you better fight. You better fight. Then I guarantee you'll see more action to where you're going to have a collision that, that should be happening in a fight. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good question. Yeah, for the first time in 15 years, something is being done. So that's yeah. certainly uh, totally agree. a good thing. But we talk on the broadcast all the time about just because you're advancing doesn't mean you're winning the fight. It, exactly. You, know? yeah. you can move forward and you can throw. And that's the thing. In boxing, you get, de you get deduct points. You lose points if you're going, okay, I'm going to go one one two six three two, and every single one of those motherfuckers missed. Okay? If he blocks your punches intelligently, He's getting points. So if they're going to try to add that in mixed martial arts, you're going you're gonna to make fights boring because you have to set things up. For boxing, they go to the body for five rounds. Next thing you know, the liver's starting to hurt. My organs are starting to hurt. I'm going to start blocking like this, which is going to you know, me, make me go upstairs. You don't have that in mixed martial arts. You have three rounds, five minutes, and you have groundwork. That's one of the things I love about pride. First round was 10 minutes. A lot of shit can happen in 10 minutes. And then the fifth round, the second round will happen. You have another five minutes. Third round will happen. You have another, you have another five minutes. So that's why I like the pride rules because it's like, hey, first round, 10 minutes, go. There, there, there's no, well, I think he won that round. He was, a, he was beating him out of two minutes and, and 30 seconds. And he, so, yeah. Yeah, it's hard. What do you got, man? Thanks so much for uh, coming here. Um, just wanted to ask, just kind of given the recent things with the UFC and the, the sale of uh, the UFC, do you think that now is the time to have a fighters union? And if so, do you think that you would be, you know, uh, wanting to be a big part in that? So here's the biggest thing. I'm very excited the UFC sold for four $4 billion to show our worth. Um, obviously, Lorenzo, Dana White, the Fertitta brothers, they put a lot of money in to get the sport to where it is. Uh, as far as, you know, with the Fighters Union, I have no idea what that would do. I mean, you know, I, I, when I first started fighting, my first paycheck was 500 to fight, 500 to win. Then when I became a professional athlete, it was 3000 to fight, 3000 to win. I lost the fight. My MRI cost $3,000. Good thing I got bonus 5000 But I have to pay 20% to Uncle Sam and pay out my corner, man. So this is a hard sport to make a living in. It, it truly is. Any sport out there is, you know. NFL players, yeah, I just signed a, you know, $2 million contract. I go out there, blow my knee out. Great. How much was that guaranteed? This is the stuff we do for a living. And, it, and it's basically the thing we gamble with, with our bodies trying to make money. So would it be something I want to evolve in? You know, I'm just focused on myself. I'm focusing on keep on winning because if I just keep on winning and being successful, keep my body healthy, then everything should work out for me. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And it's interesting because this is the number one guy on the roster, right? So the number 
550 guy on the roster, right? Is he worth 100 grand a year to the company? Probably not, you know, and that's, it's, it's a tricky situation um, relative to, to what an individual fighter's worth is. Um, but in my opinion, Demetrius Johnson is the number one fighter on the roster, should be making $25 million a fight. So, um, uh, but, uh, you know, we're not there the yet. That. We're don't not telling the that. Well, and no, and we're, we're, not, we're not there yet, obviously. But to me, I mean, th this is LeBron James, right? So, you know. If I made $25 million a fight, oh, man, we would be freaking drinking alcohol right now. Everybody. Even you. You'd be retired, maybe. No. Yeah, I would be retired. Thanks. All right. So um, what was the very first MMA fight that you ever saw? Do you still remember that? I think the very first MMA fight that I saw that I can remember back to date was probably Andre Orlowski when he fought. Uh, I forgot what he fought, but I remember he had chest hair. He was a beast. He had the Valletudos. He had his hair. bleach, blonde hair. He had the fangs. And he would move, and he, he would do his thing. And he would boom, inside nine, overhand right. So that was to my date where I remember, like, I was like, I'm in love with Andre Olowski. And then when I, even, my, even my first fight, you know, you guys probably never seen my very first amateur fight. But when I came out, I was like, <laughs> did that. Because I was, so, I was so inspired by him. And then after that, it went to Cop. And then it went, uh, went Mauricio Shogun Hua. So I, I fell in love with the guys in Japan because, you know, they're like, ah, stop the head, and then boom. And then in the first round, I was like, judge, 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 ready, fight. And it was like, all right, round one. And it was like 10 minutes, and you're, you're watching a fight, and they're six minutes in, and they're still fighting each other, no breaks. And then they, if they make it past the first, ten, the first round, it's like, oh, man, you know, that was a good round. And they're sitting down in a minute and a half. Next thing you know, they get back up. All right, round two. Fight! And so the pride was like my love. And by the time that uh, round two started, they were already gassed out. So it was like more likely that someone's going to get knocked out. Exactly, because you have, you have that long duration to where a lot of stuff happens in 10 minutes. Nothing Especially really with the yellow cards, remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, when I'm fighting, you know, my last fight, it, it ended in two minutes, 30 seconds. Like, I was just getting fucking warmed up. Like, things were starting to present itself for me to where the knee was landing, the elbows were landing. I was getting them off balance. So for me, 10 minutes, that, that plays wonders in my, in, in my favor. Right, right. And uh, was that the motivation for you to start, like, training for MMA? Because I think it was, like, eight, you were 18 years old when you started training with uh, Matt Hume. Is that 19, right? 19. 19? 18, 19, I think, yeah. So what do you do before that? Because you're such a good athlete, so, like... I was a kid. I played video games. I was an athlete. <laughs> That's all you were I'm doing. serious. Like, I see a lot of people, like, you're going to be this, honey, when you grow up. I was outside, you know, playing tag, playing manhunt, playing video games at night. And then when I got into high school, middle school, I started running track. Played, uh, I didn't play baseball. I played basketball, wrestled, uh, football. Then high school, I did um, cross-country, football, track, and wrestling. And then after that... You know, what maybe started training in mixed martial arts was Rashad Evans. Uh, there was one point to where, I could be wrong, but my memory serves me right, that in the Ultimate Fighter house, you would have to win the competition, and then you get to choose what happened. And then I remember Rashad Evans hitting a bag on a slope going vertically up, and then he won it. And I was like, it's pretty fucking cool. I was like, I'm pretty sure if he gets in the fight in the street, he could defend himself. So I literally started hitting a bag, and then another fighter, ex-fighter from the UFC by the name Reese Andy, I knew him from the wrestling college days, and he was like, hey, you can punch, can you kick? And I was like, only what I've seen in movies. He goes, you want to do mixed martial arts? I was like, sure. And I was in class, sitting down, and learning how I was like, okay, hey, this is your rhythm. Jab. Two. Three. That was literally my learning period. And you're never going to see, I'm like, you're never going to see that growth period now because everybody's so quick to get to the UFC. Yeah. To where I didn't have that. I didn't, I didn't care about the UFC. I was just like, I'm just going to know how to do mixed martial arts and see what comes of it. And a lot of fighters nowadays have, a, a, like, a background. Like, a lot of them are pretty good at, like, Taekwondo or they're good mm. at wrestling and stuff. But Mine was wrestling. I know. And it's crazy that over this, what, 10-year period, you're now one of the, uh, the best pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the world. And... Um, that actually tells you that your dedication and like the effort that you put into this is, is huge. Like I think your work ethic is better than any other fighters. And uh, can you actually walk us through your schedule? Like when you're in training camp, what what do you do? What are the uh, the things that? My friend, I, you should only have one question. You are. No, I know. You, you gotta get back in line. Get back in line. I can go back in line. I just <laughs> have so many questions for you. 
Um, it, might, it all depends. It all depends on how my body is feeling. But the biggest thing is that we don't focus on our opponent who we're going to fight. You know, we see what they do. We know what they're good at. And then we just go about, you know, training. Anyways, there'll be times where on a schedule I'm supposed to go swimming. You no, know, I'm supposed to do, you know, my speed agility work. And I'll come in into the gym and Matt will be like, hey, how you feeling? I'm like, dude, I feel like my right hip is hurting. I feel like this is hurting. He goes, okay, let's go to the pool. Then I get my exercise in the pool. So it, it, it literally, I cannot say this is what I do. You know, it's it's all predicated on how my body feels. Okay, good. Well, thanks. Thank for, you. Thanks for thank you, man. Thank you. What do you got, man? So, DJ, you seem like you are a fighter with a pretty good imagination. So, go with me on this. Amazing imagination, actually. Yeah, I figure. Um, if I said there's an alternate dimension, and there's a 125er in that alternate dimension, say built like uh, Justin Scoggins ish, about that tall and long but he has the exact skill set and skill level of John Jones, but he's Justin Scoggins' size. How do you approach beating that guy in a fight? Well, oh, so what's his skill set, or do you not know what that's? Just like John Jones, but he's Scott's size, five, so, seven, five, eight, and long like Scoggins. So basically, John Jones is probably one of the best athletes who ever graced the Ozagon um, in mixed martial arts. So the biggest thing that I see what you can do to John Jones is that you have to be all over him. You have to push the gas tank. One of the things that I have going for me is that I'm super athletic and I've run, I've ran half marathons. I know how to pace myself. I know, I know when to push myself because I've been in a race where I'm running, you know, a 438 mile to where after my third, my third lap, I start my kick at the, four, at the 300 line. And then when I get to the 300 line, I'm at the 200 line. Then I start another kick. Then when I'm in the last 100, now I'm in dead sprint after running fast miles. So I've gone through all that type of training. So essentially, you know, you just go out there and fight and you see where he makes a mistake at, you know, try to knock out balance, you know, get him to clinch, throw high kicks, elbows. You just go out there and fight. That's, that's my... My way of answering the question is to go out there and fight, see what happens. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, hey I'm back. So. I see that. <laughs> no, it's a good question. It's good. Oh, I hope. Uh, so I finally caught you on Twitch. Mm. And I jumped in at a moment when you were making us watch this ridiculous uh, Nick Cage video. Oh, yeah. The, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yeah, yeah. yeah I know what <laughs> you're talking about. This is so bizarre. But anyway, uh, one, what video games do you play, and what was the motivation to start uh, broadcasting on Twitch? Yeah, so the games I'm playing right now is World of Warcraft because Legion is about to drop, playing Street Fighter V. If they have a tournament available in uh, PAX Seattle, I'm going to try to enter it. Um, I also play Dead by Daylight. I play Overwatch. I mean, I was playing Eternal Champions, Alter Beast the other day. So I play a little bit of everything. One of the reasons that made me want to start streaming on Twitch is another way for me to interact with my fans and, and to build my brand, I guess you say. I've always played video games since, I mean, you know, when I was a kid playing Super C on Nintendo with my mom. And, yeah, why not? Why not be able to play video games, hang out with the, um, the fans, and, and stream, you know? I think it's another way for me to interact because... You know, you always have your trolls, and trolls come on there, and they, they talk, talk shit to me, and I talk shit right back to them, where I'm like, they're like, oh, you suck, and I was like, hey, have a good, have a good time waking up and going to your 9-to-5 job, bro. Have a good time. Yeah, and no, then, this I was mean, at, like, 2 in the morning that you were playing video games. Well, it, it depends what time <laughs> zone you're in, my friend. It depends what time zone. Yes, I live here. Well, uh, yeah, I was on to, like, maybe 12.30 at night, you guys' time, so it was a good time. Did you have a good time? Yeah, no. I, I bet you did. Watching. Thanks. <laughs> yes. All right. First of all, congratulations on your professional success. And I think I could speak for all the fans here. The other thing we really appreciate about a lot of fighters is them being real to who they are and staying who they are. Um, the question I had, though, was about Matt Hume and, and how you guys met, what type of relationship you have. Because, of course, he's one of the, the greatest martial arts that the world has seen, you know, fighting in Pancrase a long time. But kind of talk about that relationship and how you guys met. Yeah, so like I said, um, when I first got into Matt Hume's gym, it was a satellite gym, which means his gym was in Kirkland, I was in Auburn, I lived in Lakewood, so there was about an hour and 15 minute, minute drive between there. Um, at the time, like I said, when I was doing mixed martial arts, I was working a full-time job, so I would train at Auburn Vision Quest and work out there, and then the first time I met Matt Hume was when I had my first amateur fight. He sat in the chair like Shao Kahn on Mortal Kombat 2 at the very uh, last. If you ever played Mortal Kombat 2, Shao Kahn, before you fight, I think his name is Kataro. Yeah, you fight Kataro, the one with the, he looks like girl, but he has a tiger strap on his back. 
So uh, he would sit there and watch the fights, and I would fight, and then he wouldn't make any gesture, wouldn't make any, you know, smile or anything. And then eventually I started to go up to Kirkland, and I started sparring him. And then I never forget, I was sparring Matt, and I was moving back and forth, and I hit him with the cross, and then he parried it, and then I kicked his leg. Because at this time, he was still training to get ready to fight, I think, one of the Gr- Ron Gracie, I think. I could be wrong. And I remember throwing a, a kick and kicking him, and then he was working on something to where he would eat the kick, and then he would recall and throw a cross back and hit me in the face. So, but that's how we met, you know, me training in his gym. And then the relationship is awesome. I'm up front with him. He's up front with me. You know, we'll look at an opponent and then he will say, okay, this is what he does. This is what he's trying to accomplish. And the thing I love about it so much is that he can fight. Like, he'll be like, okay, you know, like when we were getting ready for my, my last fight, Wilson Hayes, it was like down to the T. Down to T. I didn't even have to watch the fight where he fought because I knew exactly what happened. And then I, I can read the play by play and go through the fight in my mind. And next thing you know, when I watched the fight, I was like, yep exactly what I thought was going to happen. So Matt can foresee things, not like he can tell the future. I wish he could because then I'll be rich right now. But he can look at things and we can both break him down to a T to where like, I feel like this is going to be point. Like when I fought Dotson, I was like, okay, the front kick's going to work and the cross is going to work. We never even worked on that in the octagon, I mean in the gym, but he trusts that I feel that's going to work. And then if it doesn't work, then he'll be like, get away from that. Don't do it anymore. So good relationship. And then real quick, I know you said you kind of gauge yourself on that Matt Hume level. Like, where do you think you're at now? I would never Matt be Matt. Hume's I would never. Matt is a fountain of youth. For anybody, I mean, you can ask Robbie Lawler, Rich Franklin, uh, Jens Povers, Spencer Fisher. Uh, I mean, you can ask any of those guys. Who, I mean, Dean Thomas. You can ask any of those guys who've ever trained with Matt Hume. They're like, he's, he's the real thing. And the reason why I think I would never be uh, able to live up to Matt Hume is because he is just... He's just brilliant and nasty. And the thing is that you think you get better by fighting all the time, which is incorrect. You get better by when you take time off in the gym. I mean, Dominic Cruz said himself, he's, he's been away from the sport, what, four, four years. So he's able to sit back and analyze and see how the sport's been able to grow and, and go certain ways to where Dominic Cruz is like, I'm way ahead of these guys. For me, I'm blessed to have Matt Hume, who's been away from the sport, to be able to put the knowledge into me and be like, okay, this is where we need to go. And there's other fighters going that way, but they're not getting there fast enough. Thanks, champ. You're welcome. Greatest one-two punch in UFC history, man, DJ and Hume. You know, after, after your fight against Cejudo, I said, is Matt Hume a UFC Hall of Famer? I mean, you know, oh, yeah. he's, I mean, cornering well, well, you to this greatness, you know? Well, the thing that's unfortunate about the mixed martial arts, not a mixed martial well, right, arts Hall course. of Fame. Be first ballot. Yeah. yeah, he better be. Yeah. Hi, um, I was wondering, what's your most memorable fight? Oh, man. I'll probably say... I'll probably say the Henry C. Huda one. That was a fun time. Things, things escalated real quickly. Um, but that, they're, they're all memorable, you know. I mean, I train my butt off in the gym. And there's not a, big, there's not a bigger feeling than when after you win your fight, you get your hand raised, you go back, you see your wife. And then you see your coaches, they're happy. Then we start right there to break down the fight. Then the commission comes with your check. Then you go home, you put it in the bank, and then you get back in the gym. So they're all cool. Thank you. Thank yes, you. sir. Hi. Uh, we always hear you talk about building your, your image up and things like that. How do you feel about the UFC pushing other champions, but you, you don't really get that recognition from the UFC when it comes to you? Yeah, how do I feel about it? Or, I mean... Well, like, you see him push, like, Conor McGregor, and he's a scumbag. You know? <laughs> uh, but to me, they ought to spend the majority of the time and money and effort pushing you to the top like they do him because you're here and he's here. (laughs) Thanks, I appreciate that. (laughs) Um, The biggest thing that I always try to look at is that I just focus on myself. Nobody's going to take care of Demetrius Johnson besides Demetrius Johnson. Um, And obviously, you know, Conor McGregor has all of Ireland behind him. He's brought numbers to the UFC that they've never seen before. He's breaking down walls. He's been on Conan, I mean, along with Ronda Rousey. She's in movies now. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's up to the UFC to, to decide who they want to market and who they want to get behind of. You know, regardless for me, my job is they contract me to fight. That's what the UFC pays me to do. They pay me to fight. For me to come out here, do these Q&As, to stream on Twitch, to push my, my, my brand, my, my Mighty Mouse, my Mighty Squad stuff, that's all on me. And I like doing that because it, it's teaching me how to run a business and how to save my money and how to 
market myself instead of having somebody else do it, you know? So, I, I mean, yeah, I could say, yeah, it sucks. You know, I wish you guys would, you know, put that much behind me. But they are. I mean, they just, they're, they're, they're creating the, the ultimate fighters, you know, top 24, essentially to find somebody to beat me. So people can be like, well, they're trying to find somebody to kick your ass. They're not really putting you in a house and all this stuff. So, you know, like I said, man, at the end of the day, it's always about fighting. And, you know, my fighting will take care of itself. And eventually, hopefully, you know, you guys will see me all over the place or whatever. So we'll see. Thanks. Been trying to get a Mighty Squad t-shirt, man. It's like they hit they that website. They, they sell out. You know what? I just did the last campaign. A lot of people didn't like it, but I don't know if you guys saw it. At the end of my fights, I go, ah! I do that, and I had my beer. If you guys know me, I love freaking beer. I'm a stout guy. And then I had the red panties on the left-hand side. A lot of people say, hey, you're not a red panty fighter. I'm like, last time I checked in the flyweight division, I believe I am. And the Mighty Squad members on Twitch, they wanted that. So that was the last Mighty Squad shirt and we have another one coming out here pretty soon waiting for the artist to get back to me about some stuff but so yeah it's it's good i'm sorry dog they go quick dude hey that's all right i'll get in line all right two more questions what do you got dj i think everyone can agree that you're by far the fastest fighter in the ufc and i think that you know empirical evidence would prove that but not only your speed but the way you're able to recognize patterns of striking of your opponents super you know fast is unbelievable and you talked about the fact that you're a counter puncher how did that skill develop as far as being able to see what's coming and being able to react so quickly off of that? I admit, I'm not a counterpuncher, am I? Oh, you just mentioned it earlier. That's why I was asking. No, I'm saying how people, uh, when we're talking about the rules, theory, yeah. like, you know, if a person is a counterpuncher and he's backing up the whole time trying to lure in the opponent, is he in control of the fight or is he losing? Because they're, they're rephrasing how they score fights. Um, but to your question, how am I able to... Uh, and now uh, break things down when I'm in the fight is because in the point period of my time when I was going through my amateur career, I had a very long amateur career, like where I had like maybe 15 fights along with jujitsu tournaments, um, shoot boxing, boxing, kickboxing, MMA fights. To where my favorite thing is that, you know, hey, Dimitri Johnson, you're fighting this Saturday. Your opponent is 4-0. and That's all you know. And then the first round, you're like, all right, ready? Fight. Walk out touch gloves and you then I start my I start my rhythm I start moving and I, I start seeing what their I start picking up their habits then I start seeing things I'm like okay I'm gonna test it distance okay essentially it would take me one round to do that now we're, we're professional athletes they're like hey you're gonna be fighting Dominic Cruz next time okay perfect I can sit here and, and break down his film see what he does and then I've never been a big fan of hey I'm gonna hire you 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 to come in and betray Dominic Cruz because nobody's going to be Dominic Cruz. Nobody's going to have the speed that I have. There might be people who are faster than me, but they're going to have the technique that I have. So for me, it was my amateur career that's able to give me the gift to break down and make changes on the fly because I had to do it by basically going in on a blind date on a fight. Thanks, DJ. Yep. I remember you telling a story about working in a warehouse, watching these guys, oh, yeah. you know, on TV that you'd go on to beat, you know, pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty good stuff. All right, final question, man. What do you have? DJ, you've cleared out the top end of the division. There's no question about that. You got some guys like Scoggins and Lineker who look like good fights, but they're both missing weight. Is that a lack of professionalism? Are they too big to be fighting at the weight? What is that? I think it's a little bit of, I mean, Scoggins, he's like 5'6", I think. How he's, I mean, he's, he's taller than me. I mean, I had one of my buddies come over from, from Vegas. He came over. We had three, what was it? What did we drink? I think it was Heineken's. We had three Heineken's. I had chicken parmesan, two chicken breasts with a full plate of pasta. I woke up weighing like 140.5. And I'm not even training. I'm not even in training right now. So I'm essentially a small guy for the 125 pound division. Now these guys can make the weight. I mean, if you want to smoke a cigarette and eat an apple and drink coffee all day, you can make any weight you want. Matthew McConaughey did it for, you know, Dallas Buyers Club. So, um, but to be able to make the weight and be able to function, eh, that's a whole different ball game. And I think with Scoggins, he, he's a growing guy. He's only 24 years old. He's still growing. Like, I'm about to be 30. So I, might, I, I still think I'm going to hit a growth spurt here pretty soon. But, I mean, guys like John Lineker, I mean, I'm taller than him, but he carries a lot of muscle. And it could be the diet. He doesn't want to diet. It's, it's a mental to sit in that damn tub in that hot water to lose. You know, the most weight I ever cut was eight and a half pounds. And I also fight Joseph Benavides at USA 152. I fucking did it because I wanted that money. So, but yeah, we'll see what happens.
Awesome. And will you admit that you used Game Shark against Max Holloway, see, see, a Street see. Fighter, the other day? I, I, I don't want to hear. If you guys, uh, you know, Max Holloway, bless him and me, you know, probably in my eyes, the number one contender at the 45 pound division, um, he also streams on Twitch. And he was running his mouth on Twitter saying he was going to whoop me in Street Fighter 5. I had to go shut his ass up. So I logged on. I said, let's play. I, I gave him one round because I felt really fucking bad for him. But, yeah, I was, you know, Game Shark, just straight skills. He caught those hands. Yeah, he did. Thanks, Hot ass hands. You're welcome. You guys have been outstanding, man. Thank you all for coming out early. Let's hear it once more to UFC flyweight champ Demetrius Johnson. Thank you, Utah. We'll be back up here in about an hour and 20 minutes with the fighters. Thank you all very much. The wait is finally over for Salt Lake City fight fans as the UFC arrives Saturday, August 6th. In the main event, thrilling featherweights Yair Rodriguez and Alex Caceres face off. Oh, he got tagged! Oh. Plus, Cub Swanson meets Tatsuya Kawajiri. And Utah's own Court McGee takes on Dominique Steele. Don't miss UFC Fight Night Live at Vivint Smart Home Arena. Tickets available now at ViventArena.com. No.